Yeah, I would like to, to thank um, Michael, Thomas, and Hussein for um, giving me the opportunity to be here in Boston and enjoy the, the nice weather. Um, and looking forward to discussing with all of you. Yeah, it's really a, a unique audi audience. Um, okay. Okay, I will speak about um, an experiment which actually started out totally differently at the time we were interested in, in, in studying time crystals till we realized that what we wanted to build was a little bit uh, maybe trivial. Um, and uh, what I'm going to discuss is the co coherent control of the rotation of ion strings. And um, I have here this word towards. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, what we would like to do in the future is uh, observe the quantum statistics of ions. Basically, um, yeah, I will make this clearer in a second. So the outline is I will give you an introduction, what we are after, um, how we can hope to measure the exchange phase, and then I will discuss uh, actual, uh, what, actually what we have done, um, <coughs> namely the coherent control of the rotation, the degree of freedom of a small ion string, two ions, and then I conclude with some output. Um, so you can think about this experiment totally differently. You may also think of it as a quantum simulation experiment. Everybody does quantum simulations nowadays. And um, you can think of these, so we're going to have two ions in this trap, and it, they will be free to rotate. And you can basically, if you know about quantum physics, a lot of what's going on, you can actually understand by thinking about a molecule here. Um, so here is what we, what we would like to do, or at least what I would like to see. This is a picture of two ions. And the question, you may wonder now, I mean, we, we all learn that photons are the same, if they have the same, if they have the same color and um, come into the same mode, they are the same. Um, atoms undergo both the Einstein condensation, so they're the same. But here we have two ions. They are separated by only order of 10 microns. And the question is, can I do an experiment to show that a calcium, these are calcium-40 ions, that a calcium-40 ion is a calcium-40 ion, wherever it is, and whether there are effects of this. So in, for instance, you may be curious to know whether calcium-40 is a boson or fermion. Can I figure that out experimentally? Um, so this basically goes into the direction of quantum statistics. Uh, quantum statistics is really important. It, basically permeates all of physics. Um, as undergraduates, probably we come first into contact with uh, quantum statistics when we discuss the helium atom. Um, all of us know about Bose-Einstein condensation and also the Henry Brown and Twist experiment. And the way we typically um, yeah, understand these effects is that we say that the wave function which has now two variables, because we are looking at a two-body wave function, it has to be symmetric or anti-symmetric, depending on whether we have bosons or fermions, under exchange, and now it gets tricky, not necessarily of the particles, but of labels. So this is really actually a statement, a mathematical statement, about the Hilbert space. I hope that this will come in a moment a little bit clearer what I mean. But really, I mean, quantum statistics, whatever field in physics you are in, you will likely encounter quantum statistics effects. Um, there are, have been also a couple of dedicated tests I'm aware of. One is to look for um, failure of the quantum statistics or the symmetrization principle for electrons. The idea is you run a current through metal, and if the electrons, the new electrons, are not properly symmetrized, they could fall into the, the low state of, for instance, copper, and then you would get a gamma ray. And you can also look for forbidden transitions in, in atoms, and those tests have been done. And everything holds as far as we know. Um, so, so we want to now go back and, and look at um, how can we check whether these calcium-40 ions are actually fermions or not. And when we typically write down our wave function, it makes sense to say, oh, well, 
our left ion is in a particular state and we have a right ion, and then we are happy to label them and say, oh, this is qubit number one and this is qubit number two or something like this. Um, but when you look at it, actually you need to symmetrize the wave function, so on the exchange of the, the labels in that Hilbert space, I actually need to consider that this wave function needs to be anti-symmetric. So this is actually the full wave function. And now um, what we are going to do is, now we are thinking of some hypothetical um, procedure which is swapping the ion positions. So we have somehow potential which takes this ion over here and this ion over there. And if I do this, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap the L for the R and the R for the L. I find this new phase function and when you stare at it, you're going to notice that this is just the negative of this original wave function. So basically this term is exactly equal to this and this one is here. And what I've assumed, so this is now a physical operation. Before, this, when I wrote down this wave function here, that was an exchange of labels. And I cannot hope to exchange the labels in a real operation but I can hope to exchange the ions. And this actually looks then like I exchange the labels and this phase factor comes out and I should get the minus sign. Of course, I assumed here that when I exchange the ions physically, nothing bad happened. So no additional phase change. And so the question is, can we detect now this minus sign here? And um, you obviously, I mean, you all notice that this is a global phase. And uh, in order to measure this, we need to do an interference experiment. And this has been actually described by, uh, by Christian, Dieter Meschel, uh, Christian Rose, Dieter Meschel, uh, Andrea Alberti, and myself in this, experiment, uh, in this proposal. So, um, so we have here the following idea now. We have our two ions. And we need to uh, run around now this interferometer. Um, so what we're going to do is we're thinking about backing this ion crystal with a pi over 2 pulse, whatever that does. And what we wanted to do is that, let's say, the blue part of the ion crystal stays, but the red part starts rotating around the, the axis. And when it has finished rotating by pi, so we flipped it around, then we close the interferometer with another pi over 2 so that's kind of the idea. And basically what you do then is you create a superposition of the ions being the original orientation plus in the, in the opposite orientation with some phase factor. And if the ions are truly identical, you should get interference. If they are not identical, of course, then no interference. But if we get the interference, we can hope to read out the phase. So this is the idea. Um, so, what makes this experiment maybe different from other observations of quantum statistics, often it's spectro uh, people look at it spectroscopically. Um, this is a controlled exchange of the ions, and also the wave packets are always non-overlapping. What I mean is the ions are far away from each other, and I have no chance of, if I have an ion here, to find there is no significant probability to find one ion in the position of the other ion. So they are macroscopically separated, and that removes, for instance, effects of um, what is it called exchange interactions, which are typically always present. So Hartmut, if yeah. you're alluding to uh, with fermions to destructive interference, meaning that once the rotation is fulfilled, you're going to have over the wave function uh, fringe with a zero at the center? No. I mean, no. the ions should be somewhere, right? So it's destructive yeah. interference only at one place. So I don't understand your question. What, I, what I'm referring to is that when I, when I image the ions, that the wave function of one ion has vanished at the location of the other ion. And that has nothing to do with that they are bosons or fermions. That has something to do with that they are confined very well. So the wave function size of an atom is, let's say, 10 nanometers, and they're separated by, let's say, 10 micrometers. 
Well, that was the last statement. Yeah. What I'm asking is, what, what is the observable that you're you'll be looking at? Oh, I mean, yeah. So there's another. These are fermions. You rotated. Now yeah. there's a minus sign. Okay. The two so the functions interfere destructively. Yeah. So there's another degree of freedom will come in, and that will be the electronic degree of freedom. And so we will be able to read it out in the Ramsey differential of the electronic degree of freedom. So that is is the statement. There's also another. We can also make another statement. And this comes uh, when because the Hamiltonian is that of a, of a more or less rigid rotor, and for fermions only odd angular momentum states are allowed. So that's the other and more, more mathematically precise thing. Um, yeah, the Hamiltonian is that of a actually it's it's a semi-rigid rotor, but let's for for the moment pretend it's a rigid rotor. And so the energy eigenvalues actually will go as the angular momentum quantum number squared. So that will be the spectrum. This, um, and we can then look basically at, yeah, at the, the full spectrum when we drive a qubit transition. So an optical transition, for instance, so we have the parabola in the ground state, the parabola in the excited, the, the metastate at D level. And when we now apply pi over two pulse, what we would like to do is, for instance, go from L equals zero to L equals one. That basically would impart some angular momentum, which would turn the ion crystal around. There are a couple of problems with, with this. The first is that the separation between the L equals zero to L equals zero and L equals one to L, uh, L equals zero to L equals one transition is only uh, separated by by six hertz or something like this, so this is going to be challenging. But the maybe more challenging part is that after Doppler pooling, this is actually uh, after Doppler pooling, you would have something like on the order of 500 um, L states populated or even more. And so the actual spectrum looks like this. And then you, what you can see is that you basically start driving, when you put your laser somewhere here, you start to drive all sorts of transitions at the same point. So these two transi uh, transitions where you change L by one or by two totally overlap. So this is basically a bad situation because then I can not give the ion crystal a well-defined momentum kick. I want to give it, basically I want to give the ion crystal a kick of delta L equals one or two or three or four. So what can we do about it? Um, what we thought of is spinning up that ion crystal. And that does something interesting. What it does is basically, it, now you're at the, the side of this parabola, and this looks more like uh, has a linear slope. And when I look now at these different delta L transitions, they, they don't, don't change. Whether I go from 700, uh, 7,780 to 700, 7,780. The frequency hardly changes with when I go over here. And moreover, if I'm changing angular momentum by two quanta, I have twice the distance between the two. So what happens is that then in the spectrum, distinct lines should appear. One is clustered around 100 kilohertz. So this 700, uh, 7,780 corresponds to 100 kilohertz. One is clustered around here, around 100 kilohertz, and the delta L equals 2 transition would be at 200 kilohertz. So that is kind of uh, what ha happens, and that allows us then to park the laser over here, and we can hope to do a, a, a pi over 2 pulse or something like this. So in order to achieve that, we need to spin the ions up to on the order of 10,000 h bar. That corresponds to 100 kilohertz separation, which is nice. Um, we still need to cool the angular momentum distribution to something reasonable. Let's say 100 quanta corresponds to 5 mi microcalvin. That's not so bad. And that actually leads to a line width on the order of a kilohertz times actually how many quanta you want to impart on the system. So that would then allow to do really this experiment or something like this. We have the two ions, we come in with a pi over two pulse on, let's say, delta L equals one. One part of the ion crystal rotates then faster than the other part, and then I can wait the appropriate time and we come up with the packets. Um, yeah, so getting now experimental. 
Um, this is the apparatus. It's a standard eye trap. We have actually kind of an interesting trap in here. So this is, um, it's black for a reason. This is adult silicon as the trap material. This allowed us to actually have much more well-defined uh, uh, edges and so forth. Um, and in this trap, we trap two ions, about 200 micron above the surface. And each of those ions has a level scheme, which you, I guess, have see, seen so often now that I won't really talk about it. Um, so now, the, the whole protocol hinges on the fact, or hinges on the on on uh, on creating fast rotating cold ion strings. So this is basically what we do. We first we have a rotationally symmetric trap. But what we do is we make it intentionally asymmetric so that it's pinned in a particular direction. And then we start spinning up this potential, which confines them or which um, orients the axis in a particular direction. And we spin it to, let's say, 100 kilohertz. We typically go between 70 kilohertz and 300 kilohertz. And when it's spinning, so here's a, a picture of an iron crystal spinning with on the order of 1 hertz, um, we start ramping down this confinement potential. And angular momentum is hopefully preserved. And when we have ramped it down, the confinement potential in the Einstein spins freely with about 100 kilohertz. And then once we have the spinning ion crystal, we start doing spectroscopy. So we start with both ions in the S state. I'm assuming here that we are an angular momentum eigenstate. This is not quite true. We have, of course, a superposition or a mixture of angular momentum eigenstates. But let's assume we have uh, some angular momentum eigenstate. Um, we come in, for instance, on the first order sideband. And that means we can excite either of the ion, either the right or the left ion, and add then one angular momentum to the system. Um, and this is what we see then experimentally. Um, you can see here the eye crystals actually rotating at 100 kilohertz. And you can see here, this is the carrier transition. The first 100 kilohertz segment is, is small, but it's there. 200 kilohertz, 3, 400 kilohertz. So there are now well-defined lines. If we wouldn't rotate, this would look like a totalness. But this is basically. The, uh, the important thing that it's rotating so that we are in the linear regime of this parabola. It's kind of funny that by making something fast, you gain coherence or control. So now we can start doing experiments. We sit here in this instance at the fourth order. And um, what we see here, we are quite excited to see these kind of Rabi oscillations. So there are clear oscillations there. They don't look good. Um, um, but, well, they are there. The question is basically what's going on. And so what we, what we do here is we prepare this wave packet in SSL. We impart some momentum. And then the two wave packets start separating from each other while you're driving the Rabi os oscillation. And then basically, you start losing contrast. You cannot drive it anymore because the two wave packets are, or the two ions, ion crystal, or the two parts of the wave functions on it on the same location anymore. What can we do to make those Rabi oscillations look better? Well, you ha have to make this wave packet here along the circle bigger, because then when they separate, you, you can, you can uh, drive it longer. Or you can drive it also harder. That also works. So if we do sideband cooling before the spin up, we get actually a smaller angular momentum distribution. And then you can see actually reasonable Rabi, reasonably, reasonable Rabi oscillations with a contrast on the order of 90%. And the reason basically is because initially they were really limited by that. In the beginning, we had only Doppler cooled. And that basically then led to a larger spread of the angular momentum. So sideband cooling really uh, helped there. And this is close, actually, to what we calculate based on our RAM parameters, what we should expect on the order of 50 quanta at uh, 8,000 quanta rotation. So 
Then, yeah, if you can do Rabi oscillation, you can do pi over two pulses, so then we can think about doing our experiment. So uh, let's look at a Ramsey experiment. Um, so these are Ramsey fringes, slightly detuned, so we can see Ramsey fringes, again, we use contrast as the wave packets separate. Um, on the first order, slower than on the fourth order, because here they separate faster. So now what to expect? Well, that's exactly what we expect from because the wave packets separate. But then, if we wait 20 milliseconds, the ion crystal should have rotated by pi, actually by 2 pi, and then the wave packets should overlap again. So we would actually expect a revival at 20 milliseconds, so that's actually, um, yeah, that's because it's on the fourth order. Um, that's for a distinguishable particle. If you would have indistinguishable particle, you would actually expect that revival already by rotation by pi, not by 2 pi. So these are calculations, for instance, for indistinguishable fermions. And um, so, Roy, I think you asked that question about what happens now if you have uh, bosons. And when you basically look here, you see the phase. So that's what we expect. OK, so um, well, we had all ingredients together. We did the experiment. And I don't show any data because my grad is to show me any data. And I believe them that the experiment didn't work. Um, <laughs> it's hard to check. But, um, so the question is, why did it not work? And so the, the, the thing is, of course, right? we see coherence for on the order of half a millisecond. We want to see something at 10 milliseconds. So who knows whether we maintain coherence over this long time, but how to check it, because we expect it to vanish. But you can think about the spin echo experiment, where the wave packets separate. You do your pi over 2 pi, the wave packets come together, and then you can grow whether you wait coherent for a longer time. This is what we do here. So this is now the total Ramsey time, including a pi over two pulse, a pi pulse in the middle. And then what we see is that we lose contrast after about, let's, let's call it five milliseconds. But on this first order, the exchange time would have been 40 milliseconds. So we are about an order of magnitude short. We can go to the fourth order. The wave packets move faster. Um, the exchange time would be 10 milliseconds, but now the, the coherence time is actually less, only 1.7 milliseconds. So we just don't have the coherence at the moment to do this, this experiment. It doesn't look so bad, only maybe an order of magnitude is missing. Um, the question, why? And so we spent at least a year, if not longer, to check all sorts of different things. Of course, the electronic states need to be coherent. Maybe the temperature was not cold enough. Maybe there was some dirt effect. We, for the longest time, we thought that the ions are actually not a rigid rotor. They are semi-rigid rotor. The faster they spin, they start separating a little bit more. Um, yeah, Coherence of the motion, moment of inertia not stable. So imperfect rotational symmetry was, of course, the first suspect. We made it particularly bad, no change in the coherence time. We even switched off our ion pumps. Maybe it was background collisions, nothing of this type. Um, what we did then is we looked a little bit at the diffusion. Um, so it turns out that if we let it spin, and we measure the width of the angular momentum, that it spreads out a little bit. So we get, basically start with a narrow angular momentum distribution, it gets wider and wider. It's actually funny, um, the diffusion constants we measure are 100 times shorter than our coherence time. So it diffuses more rapidly than actually our coherence. This is totally like, and this is why it's already shorter, so it cannot destroy our coherence. But there is some uh, Dependency, this is the diffusion rate in kilohertz, and this is the decoherence rate in kilohertz. So you see here, our diffusion rate is, is more than 10 kilohertz, but the, but the coherence is actually better. It's kind of a funny regime. Moreover, this here is two orders of magnitude. That's not even one order of magnitude, 
actually the diffusion, the, 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 uh, the relationship between the decoherence rate and the diffusion rate is a cube root law. And this is kind of uh, somewhat unexpected. So what the heck is going on? Um, I should say that we made the diffusion rate a particular um, purpose bad by injecting electric field noise. Um, yeah, there was a paper published by Klaus Hornberger and, and Ben Strickler from this work, who actually managed to write down a master equation for quantum rotors. Um, and we, we put in our parameters diffusion constant of uh, 10 per millisecond, and the delta L equals one transition, and it just fits. No free parameters. So this the master equation works. Um, so we understand, or they understand, the theorists understand <laughs> how the two fit together. We have a classical picture. I can explain it uh, offline. Um, but that has actually some implications. So we needed one order of magnitude decoherence rate, but since this is a cube root, right, this is horrendous. We need three orders of magnitude in diffusion rate to improve things. Um, it's not quite true. The master equation is actually quite rich. It predicts a cube root, and then it turns over when the diffusion rate becomes comparable to the decoherence rate becomes the normal harmonic oscillator relation we are all used to, so it's not as bad. We need maybe only two orders of magnitude. Um, moreover, we, um, from the diffusion rate, we could calculate we could, uh, what we expect because of motional heating due to the quadrupole component of the electric field noise. It turns out that we are limited by surface noise, very likely. So there's really no chance, from my mind, well, okay, we could do arm and iron milling, but who knows what's going to happen then. But it's very difficult to improve the diffusion rate by two orders of magnitude. But we have another idea. Um, this two iron crystal is sensitive to the quadrupole component of the electric field rotating at 100 kilohertz. That's what we believe is going on. Uh, why actually, um, well, that explains our diffusion and hence our decoherence. We can go to a three iron crystal. A three iron crystal won't be affected anymore by a quadrupole component. The next will be the next higher order component will be the octopole component, and that noise should be drastically reduced at least by a factor of 500 or so as compared to the, the quadrupole noise. And for this, actually, we believe that we would have then the coherence. Um, there are a couple of challenges. We need to pin that three iron crystal. We managed to pin it, but we had to relax the RF for this. So we have to work a little bit harder on uh, having high enough DC voltages to actually orient that iron crystal in a particular orientation so that we can spin it up and then release it. And then what I didn't talk about, in order to see that indistinguishability, we need to pull all differential modes of the iron crystal into the ground state. Otherwise, the ions are distinguishable. So for a three iron crystal, that would mean we need to pull six modes to the ground state. I think it's doable, especially since they're differential modes and have as expected to have low emotional heating, but it's going to be a little bit uh, some effort. Yeah? Don't you win in time now because you have even... Yeah, you win a factor of one third or something like this. Yeah, but more ions? We could, uh, but then we can't pin them. Uh, it get, I mean, yeah. <laughs> they just, and then we cannot side that pool and mm -hmm. cannot spin them up. Um, we could go to the ring trap, then they would have a little bit more. So the problem is this trap was built to have, to com finally compensate any asymmetry, and that means that we have a hard time applying asymmetry. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but it's interesting for three ions, there's no difference between bosons and fermions, so we need to actually go to four ions. <laughs> because if you rotate this ion crystal by one, it corresponds to two exchanges. And if you exchange two uh, fermions twice, yeah, you get the same thing. Anyways. Yes. So I want to conclude by saying that we still plan to interfere two orientations of an ion crystal, uh, three ions in this case. 
I showed you how we can, by spinning up an ion crystal, do some coherent manipulations. Uh, for instance, Ramsey uh, measurements, and if you want to read about this coherent control, you can find it in this publication. And at the moment, we are writing a really lengthy article on how to understand the, the, all the dirt effects of this system. There's a lot going on, which yeah, I have no chance of covering, so it's already 30, 40 pages. Trying to, <laughs> trying to understand. So, because the, if it spins faster, you see nonlinearities and, and all sorts of uh, other crazy stuff. And yeah, finally, I would like to thank uh, yeah, my group as a whole, and particular Neil and Eric and Sarah, who drove these experiments forward. They are all fantastic students and postdocs. And also our collaborators, which actually, we wrote down the master equation, we made a, a simple mistake, or not a simple mistake, a mistake, and, and they actually helped us figuring out what we did wrong there. And so we actually prayed for the safe us maybe another year or so. <laughs> okay, with this, I want to thank you for your attention. As you imagine, I like this idea of simulating a diatomic molecule because you actually create a molecule where you know the intermolecular axis in the lab, so mm -hmm. that's nice. But what I know so from a diatomic molecule is that uh, the individual quantum numbers of the atoms are not anymore a good quantum number, only the projection of the molecular axis would be a good quantum number. Uh -huh. And then, of course, this one will uh, uh, couple to the rotation and so on. Uh -huh. So I wonder if you considered the, this thing, which is that you don't have even more S atoms. In fact, I mean, in principle, you have a sigma state, right? And so, uh -huh. if you consider only the projection as a good quantum number, and I, I have, have not thought about this at all. I think we, we need. So I don't know what how strong could be that effect because, of course, if you take, uh, let's say, if you look at uh, cold collisions, very often you consider that you have two S atoms, and you say, okay. S atoms is decoupled from the from the rotation of the axis and you still work with S atoms. Uh -huh. But in this particular case, as all the, the I would say the, the scales have changed, yeah, because you have super high uh, angular momentum for rotation. Uh -huh. Of course, the distance is different and so on. So I don't have any intuition about how big yeah, yeah, would be the change if you would formulate this as a real, as you said. I mean, just writing this bond polymer stuff and see what it does. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, and with these experiments, my intuition was always, we were always flying it out. It was really crazy. Our intuitions were off because it's so different. Um, I think everything should be, uh, I think the single atom approximation should be still good because the S to D transition, the frequency hasn't changed. Yeah. So, so I assume it's very good. We haven't seen any deviation from our non rotating experiments. But, uh, yeah. But I, I, I have no other answer to this. Looking forward to your 40-page paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need to add that one too. <laughs> Will you be able to see a berry phase? Uh, or any, any type of geometric phase, in, in particular the uh, magnetic field, so any ionic bomb? Yeah, so yeah, the, I think that, if I remember correctly, that is on the order of during the exchange time, it's, it's on the order of pi, if I remember correctly. So, so the, the phase we accumulate due to um, the magnetic flux is on the order of, uh, you, you acquire on the order of pi radians when you, within this 17 milliseconds or so. So you turn your fermions into bosons. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, it's, it's shifting the whole interference. So we need to then, if you really want to extract whether there are bosons or fermions, you need to calibrate these things out. Yeah. And, but we cross that bridge when we, when we have seen something. <laughs> If I write this out as a product terms, mm -hmm. right, then I have SS terms and ST terms, and if the atoms or the ions are both in the same state, then of course they keep the same distance mm -hmm. from one another. 
but if for the cross terms like S, E, or D, S, you know, one part is stationary and the other part is moving, and it looks like there will be a... No, they're, they're both also, so sorry, they're, um, they're both moving. At this, so the ions, because of the Coulomb interaction, if, if one ion starts moving, the other one will also move. So, um, okay. um, so um, yeah, so I'm both on the SS, let's say they are at, at in the rotating frame stationary, and now if I give this atom, I go to the D state, they will move this way. If I get this into the D state, they also move this way. So they move um, together. What, what I meant with that, what's happening is because they move now faster, you have some centrifugal force. They separate a little bit further out, and they get a different moment of inertia. And so the rotational constant of that molecule, so to speak, is changing. And so that causes a small effect in terms of uh, the rephasing times. And there's actually then some beat going on, uh, which fortunately is also periodic, that you would actually expect to lose contrast within a couple of milliseconds because of this effect. But this comes, comes back. So what is the role in putting that into a superposition of S and D then in this picture? In this picture, you wouldn't need to do this if you were able to read out the angular momentum in the end. For us, it just helps to, to, to actually see what, what we did to the ion crystal, because we can only do essentially fluorescence detection. So that is the role of the angular momentum. One could also imagine doing directly RF pulses, but then what do I measure in the end? So this is the... the, the You, you use the term de diffusion, but then you also had on your slides dephasing. Yeah. I didn't quite understand what you meant by de diffusion. Is this in phase space because there are frequent oh, yeah. diffusion fluctuations? Yeah. Or? Uh, diffusion is, is really, so it's like analog to our emotional heating. So it's we, we prepare, for instance, we could prepare or hope to prepare this uh, I crystal and angular momentum eigenstate of L equals 8,000, but then after some time, it won't be in 8,000, it will be in some mixture of 8,001, 7,999, and so forth. And the diffusion constant is the time it takes for, for the system to do one step of random walk. So that the system does a random walk in, in, in angular momentum space. And you think that's due to electric field noise? And we kind of are reasonably confident that this is because of electric field noise. Essentially, the way I think about this, that there can be quadrupoles which rotate together with the ion crystal at 100 kilohertz. And now, depending on the phase of that noisy quadrupole, this imparts some, some torque onto the system. And it could either slow it down or increase it. Uh, the, the angular uh, velocity, and that's the effect of, uh, of quadrupoles rotating at, at 100 kilohertz. And it turns out when you do some basic uh, estimates that this actually is uh, compatible with what you would expect from, from surface noise. And uh, we also verified that we applied then um, electric field noise to the, to the trap electrodes, to one trap electrode, and we verified that the diffusion were, and also the dephasing acted resonantly. So if you apply noise at 90 kilohertz, nothing would happen. But when we hit resonance, actually, we need to uh, be twice. So when we applied at 180 kilohertz, nothing happened. But at 200 kilohertz, we, we actually then start to see the coherence time to reduce the uh, diffusion to go up. So the, the uh, the artificial quadrupole noise does exactly kind of what we, what we see, and we expect this much noise then. Um, and so that's why we believe we understand what's going on, but of course it has to be put to the test. But there not, there's nothing else going on. Okay. Yes. You think the same kind of experiment could be done with two optical tweezers or two neutral items? Yes. Uh, 
Absolutely. And then what would be the gain? I mean, would, uh, would it be easy to rotate them so fast? Or, I mean, you would probably not be deep enough so that you at some point lose So, so the way of the optical tweezers, I was imagining doing this, is to do it aliopathically. I really, basically, I put them in two optical tweezers, uh, into, yeah, two optical, actually I was thinking more about um, an optical lattice where you use state-dependent forces. So think about an optical tweezer which is state-dependent. So you have the two atoms in one trap, and then you do a pi by two pulse on both atoms so that they get trapped now by a different optical tweezer and that exchanges them, and then I, I interfere them back together. So we, we thought about these experiments, and that's where, uh, where then Andrea, Alberti, and, and Peter Mischel came up with some schemes how to do this. Would you gain something because the atom would be closer than you would you expect, or it would be similar like in ions? I think... The ions, you talk about 10 microns, right? Yeah. The difference, here we talk about one micron? You could have them there also more separated. Yeah. So I think the further they're separated, the more interesting it yeah. is to maybe reject some kind of weird, um, whatever, dark matter theories, not dark matter, but uh, some uh, uh, localiza weak localization theory. There are some theories, basically, which predict that wave functions collapse at a certain size, yeah. and so forth. Um, it has different technological challenges, I would say. Um, in some sense, it's nicer, because the two ions are actually separated to each other, and I, I think there is really not much fundamentally different from a molecule other than the size. Mm -hmm. like the size is very different. So these quadrupole moons are so huge, it's, it's insane when you compare to, to a molecule, for instance, because the quadrupole moon goes with the R squared. Mm -hmm. Very nice. <laughs> yeah, the there are people working with molecules and uh, optical centrifuges. Milna and UVC, I think. Mm -hmm. um, is this something that one could also see with additional pulses in the spectrum of these molecules? Oh, you see, I mean, this has been seen in the 20s more or less. So you can trace everything back to the absence or presence of hot or even angular metal states. So, in some sense, for molecules doing spectroscopy on night N2 actually reveals. In some senses, there are some subtleties which have to do with whether you can consider the atoms really as undisturbed objects and you don't have to, to think about uh, different molecular orbits. Um, I do not know whether they have the control to actually do an interference experiment, like a pi over 2 and a pi over 2 plus, but you can do also reveal the spectroscopy. So you could do spectroscopy and then I think uh, in that sense, I mean, in the end, it's all quantum mechanics. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, but I, I'm not really aware of what they can do, what they can't do. Um, maybe interesting to look at, look at, but I haven't. Okay, so I think on this note, we should thank uh, Hartmut again.